Hi, this is the Black Creative Handbook with your host, Cassandra Lauren Gordon. And I am here with, who am I here with? Katie. You are here with Katie and Pow. Great. Because uh, I thought I was I by was. myself. I felt like I was <laughs> so good. Oh, no, I, I was hanging here. here. Oh, thank you. So Katie and Pow, <laughs> how, do you, how would you like to be introduced to the world? Oh, gosh, I don't know. You know, I just debated with myself. I was like, should I introduce myself as Dr. Katie and Pow or just Katie and Pow? Well, I'll just say I'm officially Dr. Katie and Pow, but I am both the managing director and founder for Born Beautiful Naturals. Um, and I am also a lecturer in sociology and Black studies at Birmingham City University. So I wear two hats. <laughs> Multi-talented, multi-talented. Okay, great. So before we get into the creative businesses and your intellectual mind, we do some quick fire questions. So okay. randomly, and you just say which one you, you prefer and why. Great. Okay, I'm are ready. You, are you a morning person or are you a night owl? I am definitely a morning person. I have been a morning person since I was a teenager. I used to get up at like, 4 a.m. to finish my homework because it just felt quieter and more peaceful. So I go to bed early, wake up early, have that time to myself. Um, I don't get up at 4 a.m. anymore, but I still very much when I wake up in the morning, I like to have a little time to myself. And it's always my most creative time. Um, I think a lot better during that time. So always, always prefer the morning. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Do you prefer to type or to write? Depends. I have a more intimate connection with pen and paper. So sometimes if the typing is not working out for me, I take pen to paper and that kind of kickstarts my mind. Okay. Coffee or tea? <laughs> both if it's a morning coffee after the morning tea okay I hear you I hear you <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you two types of tea um because I know you're from Jamaican descent I was going to say like a sorrel tea or moringa tea you know I prefer peppermint <laughs> peppermint okay okay I hear you peppermint and why is that <laughs> Why do you like peppermint tea? Um, because I have a lot of stomach related issues. Um, just my plagued with that from my father's side of the family, those genes. Uh, so it just um, helps to settle my stomach more. So that's what I drink mostly. Um, although I do like sorrel. Um, I just, I just don't drink it as regularly. Um, I also like, uh, you know, uh, spiced chai tea as well from uh, India with the nutmeg and the cinnamon and a little bit of ginger in it as well. And ginger tea, sometimes I'll drink that, mm. which is also very Jamaican. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thursdays or Sundays? Sundays. Why is that? Because Sundays I get to stay in bed while my wife gets up and makes a coffee and tends to the dog and makes me breakfast. So Sundays. <laughs> Sounds like a dream. Okay, okay. I understand how, how, how your Sundays roll. Okay. And my last question I'm going to ask you, <laughs> do you prefer going to the cinema or watching films at home? I am a homebody, so I, if I'm honest, most of the time I prefer watching it at home, but, you know, I like to go out, so, you know, I enjoy going to the cinema, but I, I like to be at home. <laughs> okay, understood. So now we know a lot about your mind and what you do. Um, and yeah. Let's talk about, say that you're a doctor and you have this great how, how would you describe it? Um, in my, my mind, I don't want to say anything bad, but it's like this beauty. Would you say beauty? Would you say beauty or skincare or hair care? Like, how would you describe your, your, your company? Well, I'd, I'd say beauty because it's both hair care and um, sensitive skincare, which um, 
just kind of started because of problems that I was going through and people I knew were going through that I ended up sort of like catering for both because I didn't intend to have a brand to begin with. Um, so I would say, I would say beauty. Okay, understood. So which one do you want to go through first? Do you want to talk about what you do and your expertise as academic or do you want to talk about the brand? Uh, well, we could talk about my uh, academia because I think that will flow into the brand because they, they have a lot of connection, actually. Cool. So let's start that. Can I, I'm just going to preface, um, Professor, a little bit, like saying that um, I wanted to be an academic once, but I couldn't get any funding for my PhD. So um, I do appreciate ac- academics and what they bring to society. Not everyone is an expert, you know, just because you no, go on no. the internet <laughs> and you do a video essay doesn't always Listen. make you an expert. <laughs> So it really, it really troubles me sometimes. And I did do a psychology stroke sociology degree. Um, mm-hmm. So it really, when I hear like, I'm in my thirties, but when I hear like 15 year olds in their video essay, which is fine. And then mm-hmm. some expert and old oh, people like BBC call them or they go to a celebrity, like how are we going to sort out society? I'm just like, but you have all these sociologists. <laughs> you have all these coaches who can give you a very good, informed view of the world and what's actually going on backed up with data I just don't know why people don't Mm -hmm. because because sometimes when I watch like French stuff I don't don't speak French but if I see sometimes see French Mm -hmm. news and they talk about the world or something happening in the world they go to philosophers and they go to sociologists but in this country French yep (laughs) <laughs> they don't think of like let's go ask dizzy rascal about this big complex sociology thing and i'm just like what does, why do you go to university for why do you have sociologists i will tell you why i will tell you why because unfortunately i really feel that the uk has been adopting a lot of the worst aspects of American media, as well as American politics, which is about the salaciousness and the um, engagement and the the ratings that it matters less what your argument is based on and the soundness of it. It matters more how people react to it. And one thing I I have appreciated about French culture is they have a pretty long history of making celebrities out of philosophers, academics, sociologists, right? They would be on uh, nighttime uh, talk shows. We used to have that um, in Britain. We used to have that in America, I would say up until like the 1970s. And that really stopped by the 1980s and it became increasingly more about entertainment and engagement and ratings and, and, and reaction. And that's just gotten even worse with the advent of reality TV. And now that we have social media, it's all about the reaction, right? So people have to say provocative things um, in order to get that. And now we live in a world where we treat our celebrities like politicians and treat our politicians like they're celebrities, including not holding them accountable for what we elect them for and all of that. But I don't want to go too far off. Sorry of that, about that. Sorry. I absolutely. Kidding. You know, I think there's too much of people trying to be their own expert and wanting to argue online with people who are literal experts and have Oh, sorry. No, I'm here. Yeah, because on screen you're frozen. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about the internet gods. But I, I do, I do, I do agree what you're saying. It's like you guys have studied, you people have studied for so much time, and people want to argue with you with fact, you know, which there's just facts. <laughs> I just find it really fascinating. Um, but yeah, but thank you for sharing that with me. So, what would you like to start with to show your entrepreneurial journey from your academia? Yeah. Um... Well, uh, we could talk about how um, back in 2014, when I was frustrated with my academia, academic career, or the very early start of it, that it led me down the road of making products. Um, Yeah, I was, um, so I, before I actually got to BCU, I tried to start at um, Birmingham, University of Birmingham, um, and I 
you know, couldn't get funding back then. So I was going part-time and funding it myself. I was working three jobs <laughs> and uh, studying part-time there, which was quite a lot. I was working at Aldi um, here in, in Sully Oak and had like a, a writing job and a, and a teaching job at the, at the school. Um, and I, I just, I could not get my topic together and I just, nothing felt right. I didn't feel like the team that I had put together, um, you know, on campus was right for me. And so I was just very unsettled. And I was also going through my own issues with my natural hair care at the time. And my number one problem was trying to detangle my hair um, and trying to, you know, get something that was going to cut down on that detangling time um, and shower. So when I came across a YouTube uh, um, video of a girl making an extremely simple conditioner in her microwave, um, and it was not like her with bananas and avocados. It, she was using, you know, behentrimonium methyl sulfate, which is uh, a conditioning kind of emulsifier. I was like, oh. I could get my hands on stuff like that and I could do that. So I became really fascinated and I started my research about how to properly do this. And unbeknownst to me, I got really interested in cosmetic chemistry and how these different elements were coming together. And I decided to try it myself. Um, to make a long story short, it I started with a conditioner. It took me like eight tries and like over the period of like many months <laughs> before I got something that I could use. And I felt like, oh, this works. And that became our avocado smoothie, um, nourishing um, conditioner. So when I made that, I was like, wow, I did something that had like a really positive outcome. And it was the opposite of what I was feeling with my PhD, because all of that was very cerebral and in my head. And I didn't feel like I was getting it right, but I had this other creative and thing that made me feel really purposeful. It was very meditative because I could just spend time doing that. And I knew that whether it was good or it was not that great, at the end of that process, I would have something to show for it. And the PhD, that was like years off. And so making um, like a product that could solve a problem really became my way of kind of like surviving and caring for myself and my mental well-being as I was going through a very frustrating academic process. Okay, understood. So you talk about your first product. How did you expand? Well, after I did that one, I literally created a list of other problems that I had. <laughs> and I was like, well, if I could do that with a conditioner, what other issues do I have that I could potentially research and solve? And so that's how it started. And um, it took me about a year or so before um, I felt confident enough to start giving some of those things that I had to, to friends and family for, um, you know, their birthdays or Christmas or things like that. And then they were the ones who were impressed enough to say, hey, you made this, I have a problem, or there's this thing that I need that doesn't exist, or I can't seem to find the right thing, and can you make a solution for it? And so then I would try to make something based on their specification, and that's how our line grew. So the kinds of products that we have happen because it fit a need that somebody had. It was either myself or friends or uh, a family member. Okay, so it started with a problem and you came yes. to solve the problem. So with entrepreneurship, yeah. so solving problems. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so how did you have the time by having your nine to five and being academic is not a nine, nine to five. Like you have to read, <laughs> you, got, you got to publish, this is your life. Uh, and and yeah. academic very um com competitive so how how did you mm -hmm. do that I don't, I don't understand that life how do you do all you know academia and then do this <laughs> well I think in the first few years back when it was still like a hobby for me and um you know I ended up switching to BCU a year later in um May of 2015 um once uh because I'd known Kehinde Andrews Dr. Kehinde Andrews 
um, before I went to BCU. So when he moved there and he secured some um, bursaries, uh, he knew about my topic. And um, excuse me, he said to me, hey, you know, we have these bursaries uh, available. You should apply and see if you can get one. You know, I know you're looking for funding. So I did, and I'm very grateful that I did end up being one of the people that received one of those bursaries. Um, so then that meant I was working there as a, um, like a, an assistant lecturer um, or seminar leader. So that means I didn't have to have three jobs anymore. I could just have that one. So that certainly helped. I wasn't all over the place. Um, and I think the first year or so when you're reading a lot and you're trying to figure things out, I certainly had more time and uh, making products and things like that became like my number one hobby. That was the main thing that I did outside of, uh, of academia. So I didn't feel that pressure then. Um, it started to become more pressure. Um, definitely by 2018, it was extremely stressful for me. Things were starting to pick up more with uh, my brand. And then I accepted like a full-time um, teaching as a uh, maternity cover for another lecturer. Um, and I started getting up very early in the morning and going to bed very late. That's how I managed it. And that was very bad. And I had to stop that by, um, by spring of 2019 because it was definitely impacting my health. <laughs> and uh, I had to reshuffle like my life and what I was doing. Yeah. So how do you do that? Because um, me, I, I'm finding as things get in more in my life creatively, I call myself like a multi potentialite or multidisciplinary. I do different things. My main thing is jewelry. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not sleeping well. And I have to really mm. re look at my route, my, my routine and really try to have yeah. a routine and be disciplined. So I'm just wondering your methods, how do you navigate being very busy? Well, um, the major wake up call for me was that, um, well, between 2018 and 2019, that period, I gained quite a bit of weight, um, from the stress, um, and, I hadn't connected everything, but I knew that I had, I knew that I did not feel good. Um, and so I reached out to a trainer about, cause I wanted to get fit again. And I was going through the intake. And one of the first questions he asked me was about my sleep. And he said, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? And I told him, you know, I get about four to five hours of sleep again. And he's like, I have to stop you right there because until you change that, nothing else you do is going to benefit you. And he would not take me on as a client until I changed my sleep habits. Cause he said, when you don't get enough sleep, your brain, um, like something in your brain is triggering your hunger and you don't make very good decisions about food. So then you will reach for food that's going to not nourish you as much. It's going to contribute to your lethargy. You're not going to be very clear thinking about that. And so you're going to repeat this, this cycle um, of this. So you need to have your sleep, allow your body to sort of like um, return, you know, cell turnover and all of that to regenerate. Um, and once he shared that with me, the way he put it, the connection between um, sort of my mental alertness, my appetite, um, my energy, that I was doing myself a disservice that to allow myself to sleep the additional three hours that I needed to get, at least, you know, seven hours um, at least, I was actually going to be more productive during the hours that I was away. So now I'm like very religious about going to bed um, around a certain time. I build in like wind down time um, at night and I build in um, time in the morning where I can fully wake up and get into, into my day. And I can say that I have not, I don't, I have not become less productive than when I was, you know, sleeping before. But it, it is something that you have to, to come um, to accept that you have to value sleep 
the way you value awake productivity. And you have to think about sleep as a productive thing to your life. Mm, absolutely. Um, I am reflecting as you were, as you were speaking, I'm like, this girl, I was going to say to myself, like from tomorrow, I'm going to get back into my routine. And it's about the discipline, isn't it? Because sometimes I don't feel like it. Or sometimes I have this kind of battle of like, not scarce, not scarcity mindset. It does. Like, are you a night person or are you a morning person? I'm a morning person. I'm a morning person, definitely. So it's really hard going bed late, like three okay. o'clock, and then waking up for six. I was just like, Ugh. but my, my body's like, but I need to do it. There's so much stuff to do. Oh. oh my God, if I don't do this, if I don't do this, it won't get done. And I'm like, but to what cost? And then, and then I crash. That's it. That's the part. The cost. <laughs> definitely the cost definitely so um, I'm taking inspiration from you and um and I don't I don't want to make it seem like oh it's so easy because this is the, the sleep is not an ongoing struggle with me um yeah sorry I think we have some crossover there no I'm here all good are you there okay mm-hmm. um yeah yeah I wanted to say yeah it's definitely about part of it is the cost, you know, and what is it that you truly value? And is it sustainable for you to be getting three hours of sleep a night? It doesn't sound like it is. And sometimes just something has to, to wake you up from, you know, that, that process uh, for you to begin changing things. And it's hard. And I don't, I don't want to make it seem like, oh, after I had that conversation with that guy, that, you know, sort of things flipped in an, in an instant, it was a, it was a process for me because I had to train my body to adapt to a certain schedule. And there's still some times where, you know, my to-do list or just the way the day has worked out means that, oh, you know, I'm going to bed an hour, two hours later than I want to, but still waking up at the same time. But I just be, I'm careful so that it's, not you know happening all the time for me that it's an anomaly rather than a, a, a regularly scheduled um thing but yeah I think setting up some kind of routine something that you always do before you go to bed or that you do in the morning really really helps perfect so let's talk about more about your brand the you know born beautiful brand like tell us about the values you as a leader how do you come up with the values? Because I think in this day and age, it's not just about the products, about people wanting to know about the founder and about what you want to bring into the world. Yeah, absolutely. You're so right that it's not just um, about the products because there are a lot of brands, you know, on the market um, with products. And I think particularly in the last, I would say five years, four to five years, there's been a huge uptick and surge of, black owned, especially natural hair care brands, and even some that are curly hair care brands, um, especially in, in, in Britain. Um, you know, obviously America has been doing this for a, a bit longer, but I think for, I didn't want to have a brand at first. And I was encouraged by one of my friends to um, start selling my products. And it took me a year because I was like, I had to figure out, first of all, I had to work up the confidence to do this and value what I do. And and understand that others could find value in the products that I was making. But also I had to think about what am I offering? Like, what's the offer here? You know, it's not just, oh, here's a conditioner, here's a shampoo. Um, But I had to figure out what is this brand about? So our values are about one, providing solutions-based hair care and skin care, right? So we're always starting with what's the challenge and how can we fix this? And how can we do so in a way that isn't going to create a huge impact uh, on the earth or that's going to be, you know, um, as simple and straightforward as possible. But we also want to give people joy and a sense of safety and reliability when they use our products. You know, we want them to feel like I can always depend on that. I know it's going to work for me. I love the feeling of using it and I can like really depend on it and also feel good about the fact that, you know, there aren't a bunch of 
um, non-helpful chemicals uh, in it, or it's not being, you know, manufactured and flown in from China. It's being, you know, made uh, right here. Um, and the other part of our values is that everything that we started making really has been led by Black women, right? Not just me. So the people that I mentioned earlier about coming to me and asking for solutions, they were all Black women. So there are very few brands that when they are thinking about their products, their ethos or whatever, are thinking about Black women first. And we're used to, I think, as Black people, and definitely as Black women, using all kinds of products that, A, didn't even consider us except when it came to our dollars, but not in the formulation, not in the marketing, you know, and made us an afterthought. And I wanted to make us my first thought. So those are, you know, really the values behind the brand is centering, caring for, and valuing and providing solutions for Black women's needs. Absolutely, because it's, it's, it's very important because sometimes sometimes the beauty industry excludes people or make it very hard, mm -hmm. you know, to have genuine products which really suit our needs, um, which, you know, our white counterparts have a plethora of stuff. So thank you for making sure that Black women are <laughs> at the heart of your, of your beauty brand. Um, what advice would you give someone like, I want to start a beauty brand now to see, like, Rihanna, to see everyone can just all... <laughs> yeah. I know, they're not black, but they do black fish a lot. But, you know, they, <laughs> they, you know, people are like, oh, I can just do... I can just go on, you know, somewhere. And, you know, what do you say to, you know, to people, like, if they're really serious, if they want to start, like, a beauty brand or something like that? Yeah, I mean, one, I would say, like, this is not a game and it's not just cute. Oh, I want to have a brand and, you know, uh, for people to celebrate me or, you know, things like that. I think if you're very serious about um, having a brand or being a brand owner, then I think you need to take serious stock of what are the things that you think are your strengths, but also really understand what your weaknesses are, um, because it being an entrepreneur, being a brand owner is not about knowing everything, but it's about knowing when you do know something and knowing when you don't know something and you need help and you need like, you know, expert um, help. So know those two areas. And I would also say research what are the regulations and the laws and things that you need to understand before you put yourself um, out there, you know, contacting or understanding um, if you're going into the beauty industry, you know, cosmetic science, if you're going into clothing, whatever, know the industry that you are going into. It's not just as simple as, well, I know how to make this thing and, you know, I can set up an Etsy store or, or Shopify. It's, there are definitely more um, uh, rules and issues surrounding that, that you need to be cognizant of um, and, and think about. Okay, cool. I've got, I've got to ask this. Okay, what, I don't know how to say it as a simple question, but what I'm trying to get at is, for Black women, what are sim simple steps to make sure our skin and hair mm -hmm. is okay? Because okay. I because when I go on YouTube, I'm confused. <gasps> There's yep. 10 million steps. I don't have 10 million wash days. I don't have 10 mm -hmm. million times to do that. As a busy entrepreneur, artist, whatever you want to call me, Mm -hmm. it's matter of time I don't want my skin to crack <laughs> yeah I don't want my hair to grow mm -hmm. what are the basics what I can do for a busy like what what I was putting it out there. sure I'm happy to answer that question and I'm gonna say I'm gonna answer the question first with hair and skincare and then I'm gonna talk about why it is that you see YouTube videos with 50 11 steps right okay so first with your hair um understand that with your hair and your skin, what you put into your body is extremely important, including sleep, okay? Um, and then that is going to show in the quality of your hair and the quality of your skin. There's literally nothing you can put on your head that's going to make your hair grow. So if you see products that are promising you use this and your hair will grow, ignore that because it's not about the product you use. The products are important, but your method is also important. Very simply, to take care of your hair, you need to be cleansing it on a regular basis. I can tell you scientifically why the conditioner only process will not work and you will eventually run into problems with your scalp um, because your scalp needs to be clean because 
that is the thing that is producing the hair, right? Because once your hair comes out of your scalp, it's dead. So scalp needs to be healthy in order to keep producing that hair. So cleansing your scalp, at least I would say every seven to 12 days or so, just depending on your lifestyle and your routine. Conditioning regularly, detangling, um, you should be using a deep conditioner, I would say at least once a month, maybe even twice a month. After you do that, literally styling your hair can be extremely simple. And there's no reason why you have to use more than two products unless you're doing something complicated. What you need is something that is going to um, moisturize or seal in the moisture. So anything like the moisturizing cream or a leave-in conditioner like you have, and then a sealant like an oil or um, like a, a balm are the only things that you need. Everything else is extra like gel or mousse or any of that kind of stuff. Um, keeping your hair uh, sort of um, in a protective style most of the time, tucking your ends away is a great way of ensuring that you can um, retain the hair growth that you're having. But it's really that symbol, cleansing your scalp and your hair regularly, conditioning, detangling it, making sure that it is um, hydrated and you seal in the hydration. When you do those two things, that's moisturizing. Um, and doing that process on a regular basis, every um, at least every 10 to 12 days or so. It's really that simple and really that unglamorous, which is why you have a lot of YouTube videos that try to pizzazz it up all the time, right? Because they're trying to get views and they're trying to get engagement. They're not most of them are not trying to necessarily educate because if we just kept it to the simple part, people would be bored in terms of entertainment, but that's how simple it is. For your skin, you don't need a 10 step skincare. Um, okay, like, because those Koreans, yeah, I'm looking at those those, those, <laughs> those, those Koreans because their skin are nice. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie. It's beautiful, like it's, it's gorgeous, right? But like, if you want to do all that, you're going after a certain look or glass, Skin. And I think what's interesting is that these things like are trendy, like they come in trends. And I'm like, okay, well, five years from now, what's the trend going to be? Is everybody going to try to be like super matte or whatever, right? There was the dewy look, the, um, you know, there's a matte look. So I cannot treat my skin based on trends. I, you need to treat your skin based on your lifestyle and what kind of skin you have. Um, again, diet is extremely important. If you're having a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of like um, simple sugars, it will start to show on your skin. Skin is going to start to look dull. Um, I know when I'm having too much sugar because I start to get like small bumps on my forehead. I have a couple now because I've been wilding. But <laughs> when you eat more vegetables, when I tell you the clarity in your skin starts to improve, within like two weeks of like regularly doing that. But just like with your hair, you need to be regularly cleansing your skin. You need to use something mild. Don't use something that's going to be harsh. The Where you think you should be like extra tough on your skin, especially if you have oily skin or you have like, you know, problematic skin where you have like a lot of um, bumps or uh, comedones, things like that. You actually need to be doing the opposite. Your skin needs some gentility. It doesn't need harshness. Do not use alcohol-based toners or anything that's going to sting your face. It should not be stinging your face. It's not a good sign. Um, so cleansing, Toners are actually not even that necessary unless you're wiping off excessive like um, debris or makeup from the perimeter. A moisturizer is extremely important, extremely important for your skin. Um, people who have oily skin, don't be scared of oil. Oil is actually really amazing um, for our skin. In fact, it's one of the best ways to remove makeup um, and a, a great way of cleaning off any debris before you wash the skin. Um, lastly, I would say just like with a deep conditioning hair mask, I think twice a month, um, as many as once a week, you should be using a, a mask that's going to like gently extract or help um, chemically exfoliate your face. Try not to use anything that has really hard physical exfoliants. 
So yeah, don't use a walnut scrub. Walnuts are way too coarse to be putting on your face. Um, even that apricot scrub that people really love, the St. Queen Helene's or whatever, that's also a little bit harsh for the skin. But you know, something like salt or, uh, or sh uh, sugar should be um, okay. But that's as simple as it. Cleanse, um, moisturize, mask. Bare minimum three steps. <laughs> um, just added extra. I'm, I, as a person in my 30s, see, I'm just asking, asking for a friend, meaning asking for me. me. <laughs> my skin is changing naturally because I don't know what yes. aging means. We're just naturally because that's how life is. And I'm like, oh God, bloody hell, 30s hit me hard. So I'm just trying to like stay the same face as much as possible. I don't want any more. Yeah. Lines. I know lines are going to come. If I can yeah. delay a few. Any advices of just delaying the lines a little bit? I forgot something extremely important is that um, I neglected to say um, SPF. I want every Black person out there to really get it into their head that they should be wearing some protection factor. And this is, it's it's great if you can get it in your moisturizer, but it's something that you should be putting on on top every of a day. moisturizer. Every day. Okay. Um, okay, even that. in Britain, where you go through like four seasons in a day, or even when you think it's overcast, those rays are still getting through. You might be able to wear like a lower factor on those days. But as we're approaching summer, you know, break out the 50s. You, you need to be 50. wearing. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm, I'm just getting 30s. Okay. I'm going to get the 50. But the thing is, what I yeah, hate. Yeah. I think like the more intense. No, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. The thing what I hate is like, it's that it's the it's that creamy stuff it's the creamy thing and you're like oh why am i why, why my face too shiny but i need to find like an invisible one like a, a 50 which is in like just spray like a more serum type yeah, um, yeah, yeah. like a gel like kind of thing yeah no they people have come like a really um long way uh in making different types of of sunscreen so it doesn't feel like as greasy or leave a um ashy cast um, um as you can i would definitely um google because it's escaping me now um sunscreen for black girls because there are a number of brands that have specifically made them to overcome that ashiness problem for black people but do wear that um, so that's actually also to answer your question one of the ways to help decrease um signs of aging okay. um so i know the whole thing about um black doesn't crack but you know it, it does but we it just takes a little bit longer for us to crack um but you know it can because we have more melanin the more melanin we have most of us tend to have oilier skin um, as a result, but not, not all Black people. Um, and the oiliness of our skin does help to preserve it from showing the lines um, as soon, but you can start to get them around the eyes because the skin around the eyes tends to be a little drier and more delicate. Um, but a hyaluronic acid or something that has hyaluronic acid in it is a great way of helping to prolong um, the lines showing up, protecting your skin from the sun, wearing a hat, wearing um, sunscreen, because uh, the sun can do a lot of damage that way. Um, and I would say if you live in a climate that is more um, desert-like, extremely dry and extremely sunny, it's even more important that you have an incredible um, moisturizer and that you are doing that a few times a day and protecting your um, skin from the sun and um, any wind um, because those elements can have a great environmental effect on your skin. Understood, understood. Thank you, I'm um, getting my yeah. routine. Oh. Your skin looks amazing, by the way, for what I can see. Like, it's so smooth. It's I've got so ring even. lights. I've got lighting. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to like fade into the oblivion and fade all of that kind of stuff. So um, thank you, ring light. Lighting is, is, is everything. Um, off the recording, we were talking about you being an introverted brand owner. Would you like to explain yes. that? Um, yeah. You, know, you talk a lot here, but we're just talking on a podcast, so we, we, we're here for talking. But mm -hmm. in real life, could you explain um, what you feel about in, uh, being an introverted brand owner? Yeah. So, um, you know, being an introverted person doesn't mean that you're necessarily socially awkward or that 
you don't that you're a misanthrope, meaning that you don't like people. Um, it's that that at all. It is that um, I find having to interact and engage with a lot of people very draining. Um, for instance, when I um, I got my this term, I got both of my classes, my lecturing down to one day, and so I do it back to back. So that's five hours marathon, like talking, listening, engaging, interacting, performing, because a lot of teaching is performing with my students. After those five hours and I go home, I'm absolutely dead. I'm not going anywhere. Don't ask me to do anything because my battery, my energy has been zapped by having to deal with so many people for that like amount of time. And so it is that when you're introverted, you do not get your source of energy and strength from other people usually. Um, you recharge by being alone or, you know, being um, sequestered. So that's part of it. And I think um, a lot of times we see entrepreneurs as really like outgoing people, doing everything, being everywhere that you have to um, be at events or engage with a lot of, a lot of people. And so sometimes that is hard for me. So I have to pick when and how I do that. So me speaking here with you for an hour or hour and a half or whatever, I, I love it. You know, I'm very good at smaller groups of people and, you know, speaking with them, but it's when there's a large group of people or a large party or a large conference, I really have to, to pace myself. So I'm not going to be showing up to everything or be the one putting myself out in front all the time because it's, it's just not in my nature. I have to be more strategic about um, how I show up, the things I show up for when I put myself out there on social media as a, as a brand owner. Um, because even that, even though I'm being myself, it is sort of a performance, you know, I'm putting on the brand Cadian, um, you know, persona in order to have the energy to, to deal with, with people. Whereas like if I'm by myself, I probably wouldn't be as energetic. Understood. Understood. Yeah. It's hard, but, but, but I'm probably the opposite. I'm, a, I'm an extrovert, but I think COVID and maybe more in, introverted. Mm. I really have to, if I have to come up my house, I really have to force myself out to, because for two years I'm like, <laughs> why do I have to move? Why do I have to move? I could be extra yeah. from my house. <laughs> so that's why I love these type of podcasts. You can do it over Zoom. If the internet yeah. cards allow, allow me to be like, I don't have to leave my house. I don't have to. I don't have to spend no travel card. I don't have to. I can just stay. <laughs> but, but what I've noticed for me, when you meet people in real life, it helps more. It helps. It does. And it's a different kind of energy. And I, I, I hope I wasn't misrepresenting myself saying that I enjoy meeting people. I love being able to go out and I almost never regret that. I just know that it wouldn't be something that I could do back to back, like every day. So when they're sort of, if, you know, if I was going to events, say three times a month or something, you know, that would be quite a, a bit for me. So as so long as I can prepare myself um, for the event and like I can show my best self, like I, you know, I, I love it. I went down um, just this past Wednesday, uh, Jammy had their uh, pop-up in um, Shoreditch. It was focused on um, Black female founders uh, this time. And we were one of the brands there. And I went and I really enjoyed myself. I love the, the whole you know, process going down. I got to meet like um, a customer of ours, like while I was there. And uh, I love those interactions because it just like reminds me of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, to see the end result and the, the person on the other end of using that product or being helped by that is extremely meaningful to me. And so I love being able to, to go out um, and do that. And it ends up being like, um, sometimes provides creative inspiration uh, for me. So I don't want to make it seem like it's not something I hate doing. It's just something I have to be mindful of when and how many times I do it. I think you've been very, um, what's the word? What is it? Economical, that's not the wrong word, but you know when to use your energy and you know when to yeah. use it. And I think as I, before COVID, 
I think <laughs> let out a lot of my energy. I'm like, no, you don't have you. I don't say calculated, but it's just like you know when to use it. You know when it's yeah. best spent. It's so that you you don't want to be tapped out. And I think COVID had made me or lockdown made me reflect like you don't always have to be everywhere. You can be strategic. That's it. Strategic. That was the word I was looking for. More strategic about how you yeah. use energy because once the energy is gone, it's gone. You can't get it back. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's true. So, uh, you have to recharge. Yeah, yeah to, to get the, the battery up again. And so, um, yeah, I, I've been more careful about that. But, you know, I, I am, gosh, I'm going to be 43 in July. What? So, 43 yeah. where? Okay. <laughs> That's what we need to get her brand, people. We'll put it in the show notes because when I'm 43, I want to look like 23. So, okay. okay. You look okay. Oh, thank you. So a lot of this has come with like age. You know, I have learned a lot to accept things about myself in the, I would say in the last five years, like, okay, well, that's how you are. And just like, stop trying to change it. Just work with what you, you have. It's not wrong. It's just like a different way of living or valuing how you live life. And I think sometimes we don't see necessarily a lot of examples uh, either online or in media of um, being a brand owner, being an entrepreneur or um, defining success in, in different ways. So I've had to figure out other ways of validating my own values and, and the way I, I see life. Understood. I just want to catch up with one thing that we've talked about off interview but if you want to still want to talk about about the black feminist yeah. practice or black feminism and how do how does that work in this capitalist system and <laughs> all that kind of a big loaded question for a cultural and sociologist ac- ac- academic but you know let me just sprinkle it on you and get one quick yeah sound <laughs> yeah uh, it's well the thing is like I'm still questioning if it's even possible right because I think if you're reading people like um bell hooks and and other um, you know, Black feminists who may be from a uh, Marxist perspective, which is to say capitalism is inherently racist and patriarchal and sexist, and therefore thinking that you're going to be able to thrive under that system is an illusion. And so it's impossible because the very system of capitalism is antithetical to um Uh, human growth and to Black people especially, which, yes, I understand that. But I think what those theories and perspectives do not um, emphasize as much or acknowledge is that this is a system that we have. This is a system that we've had for a few hundred years. And I don't know if we would be able to switch or be able to have the revolution and and have another system because after the revolution you still have to put something in place that people are going to live by right can't have a chaotic society um and because i don't know that we would ever get to that process i'm trying to do the best that i can under the system that we have and so i like to call my brand you know, Born Beautiful Naturals, my Black feminism in praxis, which is just a fancy Latin word way of saying um, my theory in practice, right? This is the way I carry out my beliefs by what I do. Um, the products that I make think about Black women first, Afro textured hair first, thinks about sensitive skin first, because a lot of people don't know this, but Black people are twice as likely to have sensitive skin issues as non-Black people are, which is why the sensitive skin part goes along with uh, my brand, right? So to have like issues with eczema, to have trouble trying to quench our skin and like keep it from being dry or ashy, which a lot of companies, they don't really think about that. They're trying to think about things that are not being greasy or whatever, or smelling good, but we just have other needs that Um, the industry has not always thought about. They're getting better. So that's one part of it is um, who am I doing this for? Who's at the center of things that I make? Uh, And also 
it matters how they feel and how I treat them and the images that they see. So I want that the images that um, Black women and Black people see, that they feel fortified by it, that they feel represented, that my brand is not full of only light skin, you know, girls with like big curls and things like that, that I'm thinking about the imagery and I'm thinking about who represents our, our brand, uh, you know, I'm thinking about what's on our website, the language that we use, how inclusive um, we are, even down to the colors and how that's communicating. So having Black women at the heart or the center of what I do and always remembering that they're on the other end of that product, either they're end users or they're buying for their kid or they're buying for um, their their partner somehow. Of course, we have non-Black women um, who use our products, which I definitely welcome. But I always say, you're welcome to benefit off of what I have cultivated um, to benefit the least catered to among us, but understand that this brand will never be about you. It will never center you because so many others do. So I think it's time that, you know, you spend your money, you benefit off of, you support and you engage, but this doesn't have to be about you for a change, right? It's going to be about us. (laughs) Understood. And just the honest thing, people, you know, I'm very honest, like, I, I told her I saw, I said, born beautiful. But I was like, I recognize this, you know, I recognize it. <laughs> and I went in my bathroom, I was like, I have her product. I didn't know this, until, you know, until I did the research. So I bought this and some of her products like about six months ago. Um, as a jeweler, um, I go to Janet List. I know you mentioned UK Jamil. So there's this. Yeah, we were at the, the, um, the Christmas one. Christmas one so my products were there as a jeweler and I was thinking okay I need some conditioner I need some I need to break up habit always going to a beauty supply shop which is usually Mm. my Asian counterparts there's nothing wrong with it but if I can spend my money and I have a physical choice and I was there I would try to buy black owned as possible and reframe my mind it's like oh it's hassle like no 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 no." and every time I think of like I go me and my partner I'm just like do you want to go out eat? I said, is it black on? <laughs> and no, seriously, like, we don't go out unless, all right, we do have the cheeky Nando's, okay? I'm not yeah, 100% perfect. Yeah. But if we were intentional going out somewhere, we asked, is it black on? Even the products, is it black on? And it's really yeah. hard to think like that um, because you're so easy, just, and it's the convenience definitely and that's one of the i would say that that's one of the biggest barriers to keeping the black pound if you will circulating more in the black economy is that like it's not always convenient and i think you're so right that you have to reframe your mind and i'm really glad that you said that because it's about being intentional right um in the choices that you make and where you spend your money 100% um and i think that there's a lot that you can get online and there are plenty of people trying to make it easier janice list jammy um i think you know black pound day um all you know all of these uh, people are trying to put things in one place so it's easy for you to shop um and support black owned businesses but you have physical stores like the beauty supply store, right? That is very convenient. It's there. You got like so many of them. And so we're still trying to get to um, that point, but uh, there's a a barrier. One more thing I want to say about um, like Asian community. I think Um, it's only right for Black people to want to or make a conscious effort to support um, other Black makers or, you know, Black uh, entrepreneurs or, you know, hiring Black people. Because, you know, one thing I have um, noticed and appreciated about many in the Asian community is that they do think about those things, right? They do want to um, like help support their family members, extended family members, friends or whatever, because there's a, a trust thing there uh, and about culture and about being able to um, communicate in certain ways um, with people who have like sort of cultural values that they do. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Um, and there's nothing wrong with like Black people wanting to do more of that. We have a very, very diverse you know, culture of Black people here in Britain, whether you're from different parts of the Caribbean or you're from Western or Eastern, you know, um, Africa. And 
wherever we go, we enhance the culture, you know? So I'm really excited to see us shine and use our best creative energy to um, support each other. But can I just say this? I was chatting to my partner's brother and he was saying like, if we ask black, this is a very generalized station, a generalized mm-hmm. statement. If we ask black people, hey, do you want to contribute to a party or to someone's wedding? They're like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you want to contribute to a deposit to a house? Silence. And I was like, wow. Why do sometimes we see parties and sometimes short-term things when we're more likely to, not everybody, but just a general, mm-hmm. contribute than actually sustaining, because I do see it in Asian communities. When I grew up in different Asian communities, like, like a house like yeah I think I don't know if you're from Jamaican origin I find like a, like having a partner where you have like this system yeah I'm from Jamaica yeah <laughs> so you have this kind of um system where if people don't know this um where you trust it's all about trust it only works on trust where you give money yep. <laughs> every month or every set of time to this kind of co-op or called like I don't know, eight people or eight families or whatever. So just make, make it up or make up. So everyone gets a grand a month. <laughs> Everybody, regardless if you put in yet or everyone's putting a grand a month in. And the way how I see Asian people do with, with, with their houses is like, okay, there'd be like sometimes three or four families live in one house, one big house. Yeah. Yeah. And every, they're making sure everybody's getting a house. <laughs> so you know something yeah. like, oh, you, you got to move. Well, why are you be their mommy's boy for? Why, why are you staying with your in-laws? And they're like, no, no, they're staying there to save up their deposits and all that until and make sure they can buy buy their house and i was like wow yeah. what, like my black community can do that like i'd be a house owner you know by you know and have that you know generational wealth you know a lot of people yeah about, like representation like, we need to be rep- like sometimes i love representation don't get me wrong <laughs> but some things you need to fight for and some things you don't need to fight for mm. doctor who is nice yeah okay we've got a black doctor who but do you own your house <laughs> mm-hmm. you know are you sick and tired being followed in these beauty supply store like you want to like st- do you do, are you are you happy getting the treatment are you happy about going to certain schools and you don't know if your son or daughter is going to get handcuffed to, like there, there's things i want to fight about yeah <laughs> and there's things i just don't want to fight about you know what i mean so fighting yeah. for who or a celebrity i'm not about that life i'm really about the economic stability because when you have some more economic stability you have more choices and more options yeah. and they'll see you differently yeah. so it's interesting what you say about black feminism about how you know putting us first is it's mm-hmm. really important i'm, I'm, mod- I'm modeling, modeling that because they yeah. inspire me or inspire others to you know it's you know it's very easy when you watch love and hip-hop or i watch a bit of reality tv and you think that's what black mm-hmm. women are and this mm-hmm. is why i create the podcast that like, this is real life this is the real hustle this is not like 10 years down the line and you're multimillionaire hopefully we, or you know if you want to be like that and you're like well I just did it I just put my you know products on a store and then you know I made it no one let me tell you the A to B you know yeah and, this is what and like talking. being on the, between the A to B yes. right that part and it's funny that you say that because I have been thinking so much about that and about wanting to share that those pieces but it's sometimes it feels like does anybody care or want to listen because we idolize a success story we idolize the you know the people who went from nothing to um something and that whole kind of uh overnight sensation or even if there was struggle so long as there is this um glow up part that people can celebrate that that story becomes more easily digestible but sometimes it's not that easy for everybody you know what i mean i we celebrated five years this year and i would say that year four going into year five toughest time i've ever had being in this business and i have not been closer to quitting as often as I have in the past year, right? But the thing that keeps me going is that I can't give it up because I keep thinking of what I want to do, or I'm just like another day, or I get another idea, or I try another thing. And I I keep trying because this is the thing that keeps um, motivating me. I forget, I saw something on Twitter, this was like a while back, um, 
and I can't remember exactly the words, but it was something to, if it is your calling, it will keep calling you. And that's what keeps happening with me in this brand. Like something happens and it keeps calling me. Or when I feel really down, I'll get like a review or a testimony or it's out of the blue from someone, a customer, like where something extremely useful to them. And it just reminds me of keep going. I realize what I'm doing, but you're hundred percent right that sometimes the, the stories and the images that we see make it look like, oh yeah, I went from this end to this end and it was that easy. And they kind of gloss over all of the unattractive, ugly, really hard bits like in between. Well, thank you for that. So as yeah. we do this, so what <laughs> is, because at the end of the podcast, we ask, we ask people, what is the best testimonial what someone's got uh, from their products or from their service? So what is one of the best ones you've had? Um, there was one, uh, I would say it was like a couple of weeks ago and I was really um, happy that this person waited two years before they left this review <laughs> and they left it on um, a lotion of ours. Uh, it's called the Oat Rich Aloe Vera Soap Lotion for mild eczema. Um, and she said, I have been using this uh, product for over two years and it has really transformed my life in terms of like um, being able to bring relief to my skin and that she doesn't know what she would do without it, never stop making it. And, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but those things were in there. And I thought something I have done with my life has impacted a person this much like, I really cannot ask for anything better to do with my life. I feel like that is a legacy to leave that I've changed something about somebody's life and brought them a sense of relief or comfort because I just wouldn't give up until that thing was impactful enough. Um, and, you know, until that person could get it in their hands. And I just thought that is amazing and keep going, Katie. <laughs> That is so delightful to hear. Just keep going. That's what we should yeah. do. We, as you said, yeah. uh, you made me just think about, you know, this podcast and the purpose of like talking about the, the in-between of A to B, not mm -hmm. always idolizing the success stories, but the process yeah. stories of how we get there. The so, process stories. I'm yes, I love um, that. Keeping it love <laughs> for that. the new website. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you see, this is why you have to talk that because you don't get the ideas That's it's very important talk. so yeah. yeah so thank you so much for that, that could be a whole podcast Cassandra the process stories right the people who are like in the in between they're on their way up or they're somewhere where they don't know but they know that they have something definitely and here we are so um I know it's in the show notes but how do we get contact reviews just for the audio life sure um so on you can find us on our website, bornbeautifulnaturals.uk. And it's born with a U in it because um, we're based in Bourneville. Born, it's a play on born, born. Um, on social media at BB Naturals UK, you'll be able to find us. Um, if you're interested in me as an academic, you know, personal level or whatever, um, you can go to my personal website, kadianpal.com. Perfect. So you heard us. <laughs> uh, the products. I didn't know, but I have one. I use the moisturizer. Sorry, the leave me leave in conditioner because I'm a lazy person. <laughs> I'm person <laughs> and I just want to leave it in. I don't want to do 10 million wash days. Don't want to do I just want my stuff moisturized and I can leave it and it feels so soft on my skin and my hair. So uh without knowing I You are the person in mind because I'm like, this doesn't have to be complicated. And much like you, I don't have time for all that either. This is what I did with my hair after I washed it today. And that's it. And that's all. I don't have time for all that other stuff. <laughs> Two plaques. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Podcast, the Black Podcast. And we'll all speak soon. Hey.